Hello and welcome to my studio for the second episode of the Green Bean Podcast. My name's Katie, this is Jack, and we're really happy that you've decided to join us, whether you're watching this as your first episode of the Green Bean or you joined us for the first episode and liked us enough to come back. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a little bit overwhelmed with the response that I've had to the first episode. It's been so lovely to hear from people all over the world who've watched my podcast, seen what I've been up to, and especially the people who've taken the time to leave me a comment or um, share in some other way that they enjoyed watching the episode. I really, really appreciated it. So thank you so much for watching and for giving me the courage to sit here and record another episode. Um, so me and Jack are here and I'm going to talk to you about the things that I've been working on, which includes, as usual, drawing, a bit of knitting and some sewing. I'm starting work on a new drawing today. I finished the habitat drawing that I was talking to you about last time and I'm really pleased with it. And the piece I'm starting work on today is another illustration for a forthcoming issue of my zine, The Green Bean. And this one is the start of a comic. And I guess by comic I don't really mean something that is some people might typically think of as a comic, that it's kind of short and funny or silly. Um, I use When I use the word comics I simply mean telling a story or giving some kind of narrative with pictures. Not usually funny in the case of the comics I draw. Um, in this case it's a silent comic so there's no words um, and I'm just using images to describe that experience of being on the beach and hunting for shells and creatures in rock pools which is something that I loved to do when I was a kid and I still love to do as a big kid. Um, so this comic is going to go through the story of me looking through rock pools when I was little and then I'm, we're going to kind of see the character of Katie grow up still looking in rock pools when she's a grown up. Um, and I've done a storyboard in my sketchbook which I've worked on I want to say for a couple of weeks, I don't mean for a couple of weeks I mean I did some sketches and then left them for a couple of weeks and came back to them and changed them based on how I was feeling after coming back to them. I, I find it always helps to have some time away from something to see if I really like it um, and then I transferred those sketches onto a piece of hot pressed watercolour paper. This is on a pad that has the pages fixed, so it's pre-stretched. It doesn't really matter because I'm not going to do anything wet with them at any point, but if I was doing any kind of work with ink or anything like that, it would stop it from buckling. So that's a really useful way of supplying the paper, you buy it like that rather than having to do the stretching process yourself, which is a bit tedious to say the least. Um, I'm using a 4B pencil, which is because I don't have any other one to hand. I usually like to have a combination of 2B, 4B and HB, but I've only got um, 4B at the moment, so that's what I will be using today. And when I work in pencil, I always have to start in the top left of the image and work down to the bottom right because I um, I work so heavily with the pencil that it can get really smudgy. So I have to start at the top and work my way down, which is good. It means that I don't... Sometimes I find that there's a bit of the illustration that I think is going to be tricky and I avoid it and working this way where I have to go from one side of the image to the other means that I can't play those kind of games with myself. I just have to face 
whichever bit is next, whether it's difficult or easy, or I'm excited about dripping it or not. So that's kind of good in that way that it stops me being silly or getting too afraid. On the subject of being afraid, I've done quite a lot of thinking since I posted my first podcast episode, which caused me to be quite afraid, I'll be honest. I was feeling very nervous about putting it out into the world, um, especially because I'm using a slightly different format than most podcasts I've seen before. Um, and it was really nice to hear such lovely feedback. I really appreciate everybody who left a comment or a thumbs up or came to me on Instagram and said some nice things about about the first episode. Um, and it made me realise that there's a lot of value in doing things that are a bit scary. Um, particularly creatively, I was thinking, obviously there's there's value in pushing yourself outside your comfort zone in other contexts as well. But I've been thinking about it particularly in terms of creative work because I think I've been a little bit afraid in the last few years of of doing my creative work because I've, I don't know, I've just been, it's really exposing having a blank sheet of paper and starting to make something. Um, and I personally don't find it exposing in the same way to pick up a pair of knitting needles and knit something. And that doesn't mean that knitting isn't a courageous act for some other people. But for me, knitting is kind of a activity that's well within my comfort zone. I'm happy to pick it up whatever mood I'm in. It's kind of calming and soothing, but it doesn't really challenge me in the same way as drawing does. And I think that's something really important that I'm trying to remember in my creative practice, that knitting is easy and I love it for that. But actually, I also need to push myself to do the things that are a bit more difficult. And that means making myself do drawing, even when I'm afraid, even when I think I don't have the energy or I don't have the time. Actually, I'm trying to commit to a practice of drawing every day in the hope that I become less scared of it again. I think I've really become afraid in the years since my book came out. I think I've built up these huge expectations of perfection and, you know, big results that I are just silly. I've forgotten that drawing is something that I do because I enjoy it and I'm not, I'm trying to get less concerned about the finished result and more back into just experiencing the process. Um, experiencing being afraid of it, but not letting that stop me from doing it. At the top of the page here is an image that I have already finished. Um, that's also a page for the green bean. Um, it's a just came from a sketch that I did before I'd even finalised what the contents of this issue was going to be. I was just playing in my sketchbook and drew this picture of a girl listening to a shell. Probably the girl is me. Um, the shell is certainly one that my mum used to have in the house when I was growing up. Um, so that will give you an idea of the style that this image I'm working on now is going to look like when it's finished. And I'm not working from any reference for these um, illustrations for the comic. It's sort of half based on many different beaches that I've been to. In some cases I will work from photo reference when I'm drawing, but in this case it's kind of an abstract narrative that's not... I mean it is based on fact, but it's not... It's not a straightforward this happened, then this happened, then this happened kind of story. It's more of a, 
idea that I'm trying to capture and therefore I didn't really mind that it wasn't any exact beach in particular. It does look quite a lot like my favourite beach in Devon. Um, I guess that's the one I've spent the most time looking at and drawing. Um, but I'm not kind of sticking to any photos for what this this comic is going to look like. I'm just going for it. cast on to share with you in this episode. I'm still working on my row cardigan but I needed to cast on another project because I like to have at least two knitting projects on the go. One that is kind of requires concentration and one that is a bit more relaxing that I can work on while I'm at my knitting group or um, relaxing watching TV that doesn't need my full attention. And for me projects that fall into that kind of category are simple plain stocking stitch or garter stitch with not too much counting and stranded colour work projects because you can very easily see on the chart if you've gone right or wrong which is which you can't if you're doing something like lace or anything that needs counting stitches. So I decided to cast on the Humulus jumper by Isabel Kramer which is what I'm working on here. Um, it's a top-down colourwork yoke jumper and it's the first time I've made a jumper with that construction. I've done bottom-up yoke jumpers before, but this is my first top-down and I'm enjoying it so far. We'll see how we go. Obviously doing it this way you do the fun part first and then you have lots of plain stocking stitch to carry on with to get to the finish line. And I don't think that will be too much of a problem for me. I quite enjoy plain stocking stitch. I find it relaxing so I'm looking forward to that stage but for now I'm working on the yoke and I've been really enjoying it so far. I had to make some alterations to the pattern because my gauge was not right. I knitted a swatch that I really liked, I was happy with the feel of the fabric but um, the gauge was a little bit loose. I got something like 18 and a half stitches in 10 centimeters instead of 20 which the pattern calls for so um, I had to grade the pattern down another size so the smallest size produces a jumper with something like a 37 inch bust which is about the sort of size that I want to wear um, so to get that with my gauge I graded the pattern down one size 
which was a little bit of a headache but uh, now it's done hopefully it will work out I guess I'm nearly finished with the yoke I should soon be able to try it on and see if my maths has been successful fingers crossed The yarn I'm using is two shades of naturally coloured 100% wool from Garth and All, which is a British brand that produces 100% organic knitting yarn. And the main colour, which is the darker one, is a blend of Hebridean and Manx, which are two naturally brown coloured sheep. Hebrideans are a nice dark brown and Manx are a kind of fudgy light brown that uh, the tips of their wool bleaches to a sandy colour in the sunshine so they make a lovely lovely nice light brown fleece and the contrasting colour is a blend of Manx again and Chlen which is a naturally cream coloured sheep um, to give that lovely sandy colour um, and I'm really enjoying how these two natural colours are playing against each other. I'm definitely going through an undyed wool phase at the moment with my row cardigan which is also in an undyed Shetland. Obviously this project and I have a natural fleece coloured shawl on my needles as well. So I'm definitely feeling the natural sheep colours at the moment. Now you see that I like to work my stranded colour work with carrying both of my yarns in my left hand which apparently is a bit unusual, I've not met many people who do it that way but it's just the way that I learned how to do it. I knit um, continental with the yarn in my left hand most of the time anyway um, so when I learned to add another colour it made sense to figure out how to add it in my left hand so the way I carry the yarns is I wrap the um, the colour that I want to be dominant, which in this case is the light contrasting colour, around my little finger and over my index finger, and the second colour I wrap around my ring finger, both over my index finger, and that holds the two separately. I put some tension on them and then I can knit and pick which colour I want to work for my particular stitch. And I do stop every now and again and stretch the stitches out to make sure that I'm my floats aren't getting too tight at the back. Although usually for me the case is that my floats get a bit loose and baggy rather than too tight. I um, definitely have loose knitter problems rather than tight knitter problems when it comes to stranded colour work. But I am using the same needle size as I used for the cast on and the plain stocking stitch and the short rows before I started the yoke. I don't find that I have too much of a difference in gauge that I need to change needles. Um, and blocking always fixes everything anyway and makes everything look lovely. So I don't think I'll have too much of a noticeable difference. enjoying how bouncy and uh, plump this yarn is to work with. So it's labelled as a DK weight yarn um, and the pattern calls for a worsted weight which is slightly heavier and I would say that this yarn is even heavier than that. Um, like I said I'm working at a looser gauge than the pattern recommends and I wouldn't have wanted my gauge to be any tighter with this yarn. I think it is so kind of full and bouncy that the garment would come quite stiff if the gauge was any tighter. So, um, but I'm liking how how warm and woolly it is, and I know it's going to be really nice 
to wear when it's finished it's that kind of wool that gets gets softer the more you wear it and I'm really looking forward to how warm it's going to be when it's ready just in time for the weather to get warmer and for us to not need jumpers anymore <laughs> typical um, luckily I'm the kind of person who is just cold all year round and I will be wearing my jumpers well into July and August and probably all the way through the summer I don't tend to stop wearing knitwear and maybe there's a couple of days a year where it's warm enough for me to not wear a jumper but they're not very often the colour work pattern in this design is inspired by hops the plant that they use in beer making and so the name of the pattern humulus comes from the latin name for the hop plant and i've been wanting to make this jumper for a while because obviously i love i love the color work pattern but i also i do enjoy a beer so it seemed appropriate that i should have a beer flavored jumper and that's part of the reason that i chose the colors that i did one of my favorite beers is a chocolate stout so it seemed only right to choose rich chocolatey colors for my beer jumper um, yeah it just seemed fitting and i'm really happy with how it's looking so far obviously i'm not quite at the stage where i can try it on yet but um, i'm really pleased with how the pattern is looking the contrast is just enough between the two colors and it looks like it's going to fit which is always a good feeling when you're working on a, uh, a knitted garment have some sewing to talk about you might have spotted that I am wearing the bunny dress that I was working on in the last episode and I'm really really pleased with it it's um, one of my favorite things about it is that it doesn't have a zip or any buttons you just pop it over your head and you're dressed and that's one of the reasons I love wearing dresses is that you don't have to think about putting an outfit together you just put a dress on and you're done um, and this is really comfy and easy to wear. I'm really happy with the fit. Um, I'm especially happy with the set-in sleeves. They're the most successful set-in sleeves I've ever done. There are no puckers or wrinkles. And I think that's mainly because I just took my time. Normally, I'm so anxious at that stage and I'm in a bit of a rush to get the project done. The sleeves are kind of the last thing that you do. And I kind of push myself through and make a bit of a mess of it. So I really took my time with pinning this time and easing the sleeves in. And I think the results speak for themselves. I'm really happy. Um, so obviously now the dress is finished, I need another sewing project to get on with. And I've decided to be brave again and cut into this beautiful tweed fabric that I bought from Ewist wool at Woolfest in June last year and I've had it sitting on my pile and I've been afraid to cut into it and I think part of that is because it's so beautiful and it's also far and away the most expensive fabric I've ever bought and that's not to say that I think it is overpriced I think it's a it's a stunning stunning fabric and I'm really happy with the price that I paid for it but it feels very precious I only bought a metre and a half um, so I don't really have any room to go wrong with cutting out so I'm afraid but there's no point in it sitting on the shelf looking beautiful but never getting made into something I can wear so I've decided now's the time I'm gonna make a skirt with it and I'm gonna base the skirt on this pattern which I drafted a few months ago from a old skirt that I originally bought in a charity shop and I had the skirt for years and years and years and years and wore it to death and 
Eventually I learned how to trace a pattern from it so that I could replicate it and now I'm happy to say the original skirt is enjoying a peaceful retirement and the replacement is getting just as much love as the original was. Um, and I learned how to do that from a crafty class which I took which is called something like pattern drafting or pattern cutting from ready to wear. It was taught by Stephanie Linscombe and it was a very valuable educational course. It teaches you a method for copying any ready-to-wear garment from your wardrobe and I just took what I learned and ran with it and made a copy of my favourite skirt and I now have a paper pattern which I can use and make a copy. The only slight drawback is I do not have enough fabric here to replicate the skirt exactly and that's because it's not wide enough, it's a very narrow piece of fabric. So I'm going to have to make some adaptations to the pattern. It's fine for the back piece with the darts but the front piece had several pleats and I'm going to have to reduce the number of pleats to make sure that I can get a whole skirt out of the fabric I've got. So I've got a little bit of jiggling to do but I'm confident I can make it work if I'm brave enough to cut into the fabric. We'll see. Thank you so much for coming along and checking out what I've been up to with my drawing and knitting and sewing projects and to see how my cute dog is getting along. Um, I've had a lot of fun recording another episode for you and I look forward to hearing what you think and sharing a bit more with you next time. Thank you so much. Bye! <laughs>